everyone, and thanks for joining me today. So just how leveraged is the U.S. consumer? The average American has at least $250,000 in outstanding debt, including mortgages and auto loans, with Generation X shouldering the most significant debt burden, both in terms of absolute terms and relative to their disposable income. But just how much is too much? Cecil CEO Charlie Joachim, PSCU CEO Chuck Fagan, and Self Financial CEO James Garvey join me today to discuss how Americans are balancing their debt, their use of credit, and keeping their balance sheets and financial health in check. So Charlie, Chuck, and James, thanks for joining me today. Let's go around the virtual room and, and get a report card on answering the question, you know, how consumers are doing managing their debt, the use of credit, and their you know financial health and and obviously the health of their personal balance sheets. Charlie, on a you know A through F scale, how would you how would you grade the American consumer? You know, I've been monitoring data outside of Cecil, and that's where I see a little bit more damage. So I'd probably say like B minus, you know, from what I'm seeing. But our customer is probably not the the wide slice. It's you know more of a young subprime customer, and as our CFO says. This customer is perpetually in a, in a bit of a recession. So what we see is not, you know, no big impact today. We are a little bit, you know, we're watching student loan debt because that does hit our customer and what that might impact. Uh, but we're a little bit more worried about spend versus um, increases loss, increasing loss rates, at least for our product. So I'd probably say a B minus. B minus. It's interesting that you you point out student loan debt. We estimate that um, millennials will lose about 4,400 bucks in disposable income over the course of a year in Gen X, which we'll talk about a little bit later, about $5,500 um, in dis disposable income over the course of the year. And of course, we'll get into the rising interest rates on mortgages and, and auto loans. But Chuck, how, how would you grade the American consumer? Uh, I think it's been in transition and I put it in that C, C plus range at this stage. I think the you know, the consumer balance sheet has had its kind of peak, obviously, through COVID with some of the government assistance, and uh, that's dwindled. Um, you know, those low interest rates that we saw back uh, in 2020, 21, where the consumer probably went out and bought a nicer house than they could have just because the interest rates allowed that into their budget planning. And then uh, car prices you know, we're certainly escalated during that period. So you put it all together with inflation. I I just see uh, delinquencies on our book of business uh, starting to increase slightly, nothing to be too alarmed about at this point. But what, what you, you get concerned about to me is uh, the Federal Reserve messaging around unemployment and how, you know, that is going to ultimately be an indicator uh, of, uh, inflation. And when that ultimately gets to that right level, if we get there, um, you know, I think uh, trends could could actually still be in motion. And we, we haven't seen the worst of it yet. James, what about you? What's the report card? You know, I, it's, I think right in between, I think C plus to, to B minus is right. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, after the, uh, the Great Recession, uh, in 2010, most credit cards uh, are now on a floating rate interest interest program. So when interest rates go up, uh, the customers' you know, minimum payments go up. Um, the balances ultimately end up going up, and uh, we've seen that. You know, we first time we ever hit I think a trillion dollars now in, in credit card balances as a as a nation. Um, yeah, the other thing that's kind of fascinating is you know because this is such a weird period of time. Uh, there's still roughly, you know, one and a half jobs open per eligible person who's looking for a job. So you still have a lot of companies that are, you know, trying to fill roles. Um, and, and yet, you know, unemployment rate is, is still pretty low. Uh, but you combine that with the cumulative effect of, uh, of inflation over the last three years. And, you know, having a you know, one percent change year over year of inflation, two percent change year over inflation. It, it doesn't really make a difference when, as you pointed out, you know, you're over twenty percent, you know, cumulatively over the last three years. So um, the other thing, also, just to talk about, is that you know, with student loan payments finally um, coming back to life, 
uh, that's going to put pressure on the on people's balance sheets. To you know, can they buy a house? Are you going to buy a house at an eight percent mortgage? You know, your the amount of house you can buy at an eight percent mortgage is fifty percent of what it would cost if it was a four percent mortgage. You know, and so it's it's such a weird period of time, and you know, I, I think time will tell of of how um, the American consumer um, you know uh, is doing over the next few years. Where are consumers turning? for help and what tools can they use to help better navigate some of the uncertainty? Charlie, I'll start with you. Well, I, definitely our space is probably going to see some drive. I, I think buy now, pay later is a, tends to be a product that's used, like as I mentioned, younger subprime customer. But I think as some households get stretched or, you know, so, you know, maybe a household members laid off from a job or whatever it might be, I think they'll turn to alternative sources and buy now pay later is one of those. So I, we're expecting it to come if the economy does worsen as Chuck's predicting. Well, I mean, with that though, obviously comes the uh, managing the risk associated with people who can obviously repay. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. But our, our viewpoint again is, you know, when you have this younger subprime customer, they're in this perpetual recession, which I, I believe as well. And I th- they are ten- tend to be paycheck to paycheck. So when you're talking about that average $400 balance, I think when you look at an average BNPL customer, many of them are might be sub because of you know how they're working paycheck to paycheck and how they're, you know un- unfortunately. Um, but I think the customers that are looking for alternatives might actually be in a, in a higher strata and just temporarily having to look for options, which you know, our viewpoint is that introduces potentially higher quality customers into this um, domain. But I, you know, buy now, pay later is just one of those options. There are also long-term installment companies out there that are offering options. Um, but you know, I, I think there's gonna be a few places they're gonna look, no, no doubt about it. Chuck, Chuck how, are, how are credit unions preparing to help members navigate the uncertainty? I know, you know the, the, tr- the trusted relationship the affinity that members have with their financial institution has always been something that has been a, a real um, competitive differentiator for credit unions. What are, what are you guys doing? Yeah, it's it's more than a statement that credit unions are focused on financial wellness for all. So it starts with education, but it also includes programs uh, around debt management, um, you know, workout arrangements, uh, all those are in play. And I think credit unions are gearing up for that. It's interesting. One of the points that James was making, um, we've seen a number of financial institutions drop their mortgage staff. You know, as you look at mortgages and just the housing industry being kind of a baseline foundational piece of our economy with uh, mortgage rates at that 8% level that James referenced, you know, you, you just are not seeing the uh, take of a new build or even the inventories low on existing homes just because uh, so many of those interest rates uh, exist under 3%. And, you know, it doesn't make sense to make that transition when you're going to go to a significantly higher rate. So I think it's going to be interesting to watch if uh, home equity gets tapped deeper. Uh, I agree with uh, what Charlie's saying, uh, the buy now, later, uh, pay later strategies, different ways to extend your income you know, I think are going to be a first step for those types of consumers. And, you know, your study definitely showed an uptick in, uh, I think, in the one segment of, you know, the consumers that are behind are behind like on 14 different payments, if if I recall correctly. And, you know, you, you see that as a trend. People are going to pay their mortgage. They're going to pay their car. They're going to pay their cell phone and they have to do obviously food and resources to just basically live. But beyond that, you know, it almost comes down to a prioritization of how they live month to month. And it's it's sad this early to start seeing 14 payments per, perhaps being behind. And, you know, I, I worry, uh, as I'm sure uh, Charlie uses the data to see, you know, around the world with buy now, pay later, seeing some of the stacking that has gone on in other countries, um, it's hope. It's it's my hope uh, that credit unions can, you know, manage with their member uh, a good financial strategy to avoid some of those pitfalls in it. But uh, those are very useful tools in terms of extending uh, the income. And we, you know, the last stat I'll throw out is, you know, it's 
than within the last 60 days that uh, it was reported that credit card debt has now exceeded for the first time a trillion in the US. I mean, that that's a pretty staggering number. And that that shows to me as we went through COVID and debit cards were kind of the driving uh, tool because of the cash availability that consumers have. Now they've switched to the credit card. And I think that's just, you know, an, a symbolic move basically of where we are in this cycle. And one of the things that, um, two things that I thought in the report were interesting, um, the the number of incidences of, of, of overdrafts by the, these, these high debt consumers. And I mean, it seems to be a tool that they rely on in order to, I mean, there is the extension of credit, so they're not late, but you know, that in and of itself is a, is, is a behavior that you certainly don't want people to rely on as a way to, 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 to make ends meet. And then the other statistic, um, which we just uncovered is 41% of people are making partial payments, including utility bills, including insurance bills, you know, they're making partial payments for credit cards. And that is a behavior that's very different than we observed a year ago. So it does show that the consumer is pressured and, you know, they're trying to navigate lots of different ways in order to um, pay what they think they need to in order to keep their utilities, you know, their electricity and their water from being shut off, make the minimum payment on their credit card, um, not have their insurance revoked. But and their and their phone bills, of course, which which they pay. But everything else seems to fall off the uh, fall off the list. I mean, James, in, in terms of um, consumers looking at credit builder tools to help them get a handle on where they are, their financial situation today, but improve it. Um, what are what are some of the behaviors that you're seeing? You know, we. We we started the company in 2015, uh, self financial, you know, during the Obama administration, and so we've, you know, we've seen the, b- the behavior of the consumer, uh, you know, change over the last eight years, and you know, the one thing that we can say for certain is that the cost of living has gone up quite a bit over the last three years, and the cost of credit has gone up quite a bit over the last three years, uh, and those two things means that the consumer has to result to making things like partial payments. Or having to choose which bill do they pay? Do they pay? Um, and you know, one of the things that's been so fascinating for us is, uh, you know, we recently partnered with a nonprofit uh, called Spring Four, and we've been working with them for uh, I think three or four years now. And one of the uh, one of the most requested uh, programs that Spring Four has is uh, food assistance. You know, trying to find uh, cheaper food, or try, trying to find uh, government assistance on food, or you know, trying to get uh, government assistance on utilities, and and trying to find other programs that are designed to lower moderate income consumers that are you know looking for ways to improve the financial situation. Because ultimately, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you've got your income and you minus your expenses, and you know you're you're uh, in the red every month, uh, you're going to have to turn to credit, and you're going to have to find a way to support yourself. Uh, and so I, I think what we're going to see a lot more is, um, you know, companies and nonprofits that are you know, trying to find innovative solutions to to help that low to moderate income consumer. And 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 what specifically though does that does that mean in practice for a consumer who's struggling today? I mean, you, you look at the paycheck to paycheck statistics. Sixty two percent now of consumers are living paycheck to paycheck, which means they need their next paycheck to make their to meet their financial obligations, forty-four percent of consumers earning, you know, more than a hundred thousand dollars a year, same boat. Seventy-one percent of millennials, same boat. Seventy-eight percent of those earning less than fifty thousand dollars. So it's a, I mean, it's an issue um, that everyone, yeah. um, most everyone, is facing. And it also means that you know, how are you going to build up a down payment if you want to buy a mortgage, buy, buy a house rather? Um, if you're constantly in the red and and you know you have to turn to credit, whether it's you know, traditional credit or buy now pay later or some other form, um, you know it's a it's a really tough situation for the consumer because the consumer has to you know be able to have a positive cash flow to to build savings and have a comfortable life. Well, Chuck, when when you think about the role of the credit union in helping to create financial health for 
for members and, and helping them thread the needle between the responsible use of credit and you know building up their cash, their cash reserves and 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 managing their personal cash flow. I mean, are there specific tools that you have put in place that are helping? Yeah, there's, um, you know, we talked about uh, Gen X and um, Charlie referenced that uh, even younger demographic, uh, you know, gamification is something they are very comfortable with. It's something they grew up with. So in a lot of the digital and mobile banking platforms now, we're seeing an ability to customize uh, a budgeting system to you know, send you reminders when you hit a certain level of spending during a month, um, you know, manage uh, based on the balances in, in your share account. So using tools like that where they're very comfortable, I think is uh, providing some support uh, now. And, you know, there's always, always the uh, people side. And I think, you know, as we talk about getting transactions out of the branches, this is a really good uh, opportunity for consumers to use the branch because the employees in those branches are well trained on helping the consumer to come up with a solution that uh, hopefully can avoid uh, delinquent payments, but also even more importantly, uh, avoid bankruptcy, which the study touches on as well. So uh, I think that automated self-service tool is the one that uh, I like seeing and watching just because uh, those demographics are so comfortable with it. And, you know, I won't say it's a game, but it's almost uh, viewed a bit that way just because of, you know, how it's geared towards challenging and making sure that uh, the consumer is aware of what's going on throughout the month. I think, you know, part of closing the loop, though, isn't just letting people know that you're behind or you've got this bill and, you know, it's going to be late. It's, there has to be the positive side, right? Because sometimes people get a lot of negative news and they don't know what to do about it. So, you know, how do you create an environment where you're informing, but you're also suggesting, um, you know, behaviors that that help, you know, navigate the uncertainty, but also reward consumers for, for making, you know, for making positive steps forward. I mean, Charlie, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a great point. You know, it says a lot, we're our credit builder, is, is one way we view that is just explaining to customers by building your credit score, how much you can save in the future when you're looking for your next loan or your next credit tool. You know, that, that's one example. We're also doing things within Sezzle, you know, upcoming launches of products to incentivize on-time payments. You know, we call it, it's called payment streaks, where basically you keep on hitting payment timing on, on, on time. You're gonna get rewards not within Sezzle itself. So teaching that right behavior of making sure that you're not tripping on payments. And then also within our own ecosystem, we have Sezzle U, an education platform. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done within the financial world. And I think a lot of companies are doing that, you know, a lot of the fintechs, especially. One of my concerns actually is, is in this time period, this, you know, I call it tech apocalypse, that a lot of these companies that have been trying to offer, you know, credit building, tools, education, et cetera, if they're not able to make ends meet themselves, the companies, a lot of those, these helpful tools might fall away. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's, a lot of users are not getting this education in school anymore. So they're not getting it from their families. So I think financial institutions, if they can educate customers on what could be helpful in their future and just show them the dollars of how that could help them. I mean, you improve, improve your credit score by 100 points. Your payment on a potential house goes down by maybe a couple hundred dollars per month or more. You know, it's, it's a big deal. So I think it's on, we, we kind of view it as on us a little bit to help the customer and educate them. James, what are, what are the things that are helping to change consumer behavior with respect to the responsible use of credit, for, particularly for those who are really struggling? Well, I, I can talk about, you know, what we're doing itself. And, and I'd say that there's really two components here. The first is uh, candid communication, you know, telling the customer, when they're on track or when they're not on track and being very upfront and being very clear. For example, you know, you're one day past due. Here's what's going to happen after 15 days, so and so and so. And so, and so that kind of communication of being very, very direct to the consumer, giving them options and saying, hey, you can, you can keep on this path, but if, if you don't pay, this is going to happen. Otherwise, 
uh, you're going to be a reporter late to the credit bureaus and it's going to hurt you. We don't want that, but this is what's going to happen if you don't pay. Um, so the candid communication is a huge component of this. The, the other piece is, uh, you know, reinforcing positive behavior. And, and so we have a, a program where people start out with um, a secured credit card. And when they pay on time, uh, many of them will get access to a partially secured. And if you pay on time with that one, you may get access to the unsecured and providing a pathway of, hey, you're doing the right thing. Congratulations. You're approved. Here you go. And just doing that over and over again, um, you know, allows you to reinforce positive behavior while ultimately for the consumer, you know, these are the these are the kind of habits they need to have making on time payments, spending responsibly, showing utilization, keeping that utilization down. And, uh, and that's, that's really, um, you know, the strategy that we've taken here at, at, at self. Seeing and, and availability of your credit score is so prevalent now. I mean, a lot of these um, digital mobile banking platforms, it's, it's part of the entry screen when you come on. So uh, encouraging through education of how to influence and how to increase that score over time, I think is a hugely valuable tool to the consumer. Chuck, what about so, so as as we as we wrap, g- giving the consumer a better grade in terms of their their use of, of 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 credit and their personal balance sheets? I mean, what are some of the things that that you're focused on to give consumers, you know, a better a better opportunity to be to be top of the class? Yeah, it's I think a journey. It's not going to happen direct to turn the direction on this. Um, you know, inflation seems to be, it is what it is. So uh, as as we accept that, uh, supporting the consumer, like we said, through education programs and through different ways of, of you know, workouts or uh, programs that help them get in, onto more stable footing are clearly there. I, I would say from the credit union side, uh, credit unions are typically going to have a, a bit better rate structure. And, you know, as... Uh, you can see the federal government in in the study. It was also referenced are looking at, you know, perhaps regulating late fees even more, uh, regulating some of the other uh, punitive type things on these. You know, how can we keep the consumer from avoiding those? You know, be proactive and getting them. So uh, I think that contact point and the relationship that you referenced earlier that credit unions have with the members, they're they're going to have to tap into it, and the consumer is going to have to be willing to engage that way. So I think more around that financial wellness for all, you're going to see those types of uh, initiatives in the local communities that credit unions are in to support it. You know, we're even seeing gas prices now kind of head back up. It it hasn't been as prevalent in the news as it was a few years ago, but it's happening. So, you know, I think the consumer just has to be uh, aware of those changes and, and I think a real strong indicator is going to be this upcoming holiday season. You know, how how does the consumer react during the holiday season with non-essential stuff? And we'll get a pretty good read as to uh, how we're heading into the next year. I think what's going to be interesting is to see the the relationship between grocery spend, because grocery prices are still high and people entertain a family for the holidays, and how that affects the, you know, the retail side of of the spending ledger for holiday purchases, but you know, you make a point about about you know relaxing late fees and and providing flexibility. How far can you really go, Chuck, um, as a financial institution, in giving consumers that flexibility? Well, I think certainly from a credit union standpoint, they're they're always going to look at did you know one payment trigger six others from failing to go through successfully and. You know, if that's the case, uh, trying not to gouge the consumer, but um, you know that that just being one mechanism. I think you know um, NSF fees on checking accounts have gotten a lot of scrutiny, and uh, either financial institutions have reduced them, or even in some cases are giving the consumer 24 hours to rectify uh, the charge that's being presented. And, um, you know, tools like that, I think, are going to be even more important as we go through this journey. Charlie, you have the last word. Um, Strategies, tools to give consumers, you said a B minus. 
improve their improve their grade? Well, I think it really does come down to just education and, and how much your credit score. I, I really lean on the credit score aspect of it, how much your credit score can help you in improving your credit score, being on time. And I think, you know, the Chuck, James, they mentioned, you know, the customer is upside down in some cases, no doubt about it. Like, but what I think what ends up happening is in, in the micro view of that customer, they understand that they're upside down. They seek out more gigs. They seek out more jobs. They also get better in their roles over time. They get raises. So, so their income starts to rise to fight out of it. They also realize where they have to make choices, as Chuck pointed out. Some choices may not be a good one in the end. Like they might have to let something you know go off, which could hurt their credit score. But in the end, it's I think it's very memorable. And then they'll fix their balance sheet in the, in the future. And that's also why you see credit scores improve with age, because it takes that one event for a customer to realize I, I, I can't do that again. You know, so I, I guess I'm hopeful in the sense that I think the customers, as as you give them the educational tools, teach them about how important credit scores are to their future on time payments. I think they eventually start to self-correct. It just takes time. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that, and I think you know we now have the data and the tools to you know provide consumers with that awareness and and, and to deliver it in a way that's helpful, not not scary, because you know when people feel desperate, they. Uh, you know, some people shut down. So, so I think in 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 a way that's uh, um, not only transparent, but as I said, helpful and uh, and constructive. James, Chuck, and Charlie, thanks so much for a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thanks for all of you for tuning in today. Thank you.